Welcome, friends. Welcome. This is always one of the uh, most enjoyable uh, events that I do each year. And a lot of that is because of this very sort of heartful relationship that I have with, with the story of Jesus. And just as a way of introduction, I would say that my first ideas, my first experience, experiences of spirit were really centered around the Christian faith. Although our family wasn't necessarily a great church-going family, we, my parents tried to take us to church for a while, but that quickly sort of broke down. But there was always a lot of, a lot of open discussion in the family I was raised in and also in the greater family of aunts and uncles and grandmothers and grandfathers and cousins and spirituality was always a very very deep part of the mix of what would what we would talk about when we would we, we would get together which was fortunately quite often and as a kid I used to just love those old spiritual those religious epic movies on TV if you remember them in my generation and even the generation before me there was things like you know the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston playing you know and there was many other these sort of big 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 um, spiritual epics and there and as a child I would be totally fascinated like seven eight years old just glued to the TV and not so much simply because of the story because sometimes I was I could follow it and other times I couldn't follow it and yet there was something that was being elicited. The sense of the sacred was very, very high, heightened for me during those times. And any time that I would walk into a church, I would immediately have this very visceral sense of a very heightened sense of the sacred. And so in growing up, somehow the whole Christian tradition would elicit for me this deep sense of the sacred. Very, very, very profound sense of the sacred. And later in life, of course, when I got, I would say, hit with the enlightenment bug, and I started and I woke up one day and realized that my life was over at 20 years old. Kind of a strange time to wake up and realize your life is over. The life that you've known it is over. And I actually remember telling my mother at the time, I said, my life's over. <clears throat> Unfortunately, she, you know, was used to me being strange. <laughs> and so, of course, she just sort of nonchalantly said, Really? How so? <clears throat> and I said, I don't know, but I, as soon as I got up out of bed, I could tell that some other force has taken over my life, and it's not going to be about anything I thought it was going to be about. It's going to be about spirit, and I don't know what that means, and I don't know where that's going to go. And yet I know absolutely that, that today is the beginning of that life and I have no choice in the matter. Only in retrospect did I realize that that was a great grace to have no choice in the matter. And of course later, of course I, I followed of course the, the path of, of Zen Buddhism, but, if, but in the midst of that, Jesus and the Jesus story and Christianity visited me once again. And after four or five years of practicing Zen, I started to get very attracted once again to Christianity and the Christian mystics. And in that immersion into that, into that world and into the teachings of the mystics, there was a, an immense opening of the spiritual heart, which of course was why I was kind of pulled in that direction. I didn't know why at the time. For all I knew, I was a Buddhist guy, gonna, maybe going to become a Christian guy. Very confusing to the mind, but of course spirit always knows what it's doing. And so I was pulled in that direction for a while and until I had sort of this immense spiritual opening of the heart of this unconditional, unbound love. And one day I found myself in a church in, pa in uh, Palo Alto, but in Cupertino, 
I went to the Catholic Church because I was reading all about Catholic mystics. And so I went to the church and I went to, to the、uh, Mass. And I absolutely loved the Mass. I had no idea what was going on. You know, because if, if you haven't grown up in it, you don't know why you're getting up and sitting down and getting up and sitting down. And everybody knows prayers that you don't know and everything. But I had learned a, a long time ago through my Zen training, which they don't tell you anything about anything. You just learn to let go into what's happening. And through letting go, you'll be informed in, on the inside, interiorly, about what it's all about. And, Fortunately, I had learned that lesson, so I just sort of let myself fall into this beautiful rhythm of this mass. And of course, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to do this at the time, but I found myself going up and doing the communion. And I, I didn't know if you're not Catholic, you weren't supposed to do that, but I ended up going there and having the, the, the communion and the wine and the whole thing. And it was absolutely, to me, a, a very, very profound experience for me. I had never done it before, and it was. It opened something that was really quite amazing within me. And of course, then I sat down and the priest gave a talk. And for better or worse, I always figure everything's for the better, no matter what it looks like at the time. It was sort of one of those sort of, sort of spiritual, political talks, which immediately I just said, as soon as the, the priest started to speak, I could feel just the. The, the beauty of the spirit just sort of psh, just leave the room. And so I, th- and I knew at that moment, okay, I guess I'm not going to be a Catholic. I, I got it.、Huh? <clears throat> which it could have gone the other way, which would have been fine too. It was just, again, it was the way that whatever, the greater intelligence was just guiding me along and telling me and, and pulling me into what I needed and needed to receive and needed to open to. And that it also didn't allow me to become attached to it. As soon as it, I had received what I was there for, in its own way, spirit always knows when to let you move on. And so I found myself moving on. And yet, from that time on, through all the years that ensued, and especially, and Actually, most deeply and most significantly, after my own process of awakening to the One. And then I started to see that that awakening itself was actually in the story. I had never been able to see that. I don't think I could have possibly seen it until it had happened. And after it had happened, I could very clearly see that the story itself. Even apart from the teachings, but the story, the life of Jesus was actually a, an expression of the awakening of, of a soul. And I could see it very, very clearly. And it wasn't something that anybody taught to me. It wasn't sort of a Buddhist interpretation of the Bible or a Hindu interpretation of the Bible. It was just my eyes had been opened, and all of a sudden I could see things that I hadn't been able to see in it before. And one of the things that I actually started to appreciate the most, which I found to be very unique in the Christian tradition, was that it has a humanity in it that's often missing in spiritual traditions. By that I mean is that this character of Jesus was both human and divine.、Hmm? And often in spiritual literature, the human part is almost eradicated and the divine part is totally highlighted. And nothing about the human, there's very little human in the divine figures you find in the, in the stories and legends and myths of a lot of traditions. And yet in this particular story, that the central figure was at once human and divine, which had both of these natures simultaneously. Existing, and I saw that this was really the, one of the most profound gifts of that tradition. And it seems to me it's one of the things that draws people to it without them even knowing why, is because ultimately, in the story, regardless of how people interpret it, but the story itself, the life of Christ itself, was a living expression of the divine and the human 
married, merged as one thing and one movement in one event, which of course was a perfect expression of what I had realized in my own process of, of awakening. And one of the other things I like about doing this is because I get to, it's one of the, the only time during the year that I get to hold on to a, carry a Bible. And you know, there's a lot of Baptists in the family history. You know? <clears throat> My grandfather was known as the deacon. And all his friends called him the deacon. Because he was a deacon, but he was, he was more than a deacon. He was, he was a very spiritual man. And so we have like this, in both sides of the family, this sort of transmission of the Baptist faith, you know. And Baptists love to hold on to Bibles and wave them. I'm not much of a of a Bible waver, but I certainly, something sounds familiar as soon as I pick it up and it, you know, so it's, 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 it's enjoyable. And like always, ever since I started to teach, that spirit has never allowed me really to prepare for what I do. Other people, I've always been amazed that other people can actually prepare and they can come up with something to say. And yet the way Spirit has always had it for me was I don't get to do that. No matter how much I try, plan, or intend, it just seems to be the way that it works within me that I never really get to prepare for anything. So this time I kind of knew that I wasn't really going to get to prepare much. But I do have some, there are some sort of favorite lines in, in the New Testament that I want to use to illustrate some things that I think are really quite beautiful. Um, and I think one of the most telling things about the whole story of Jesus is right at the beginning where um, the Virgin Mary is giving birth right, to the Son of God. And this is, this is, in, this is a very direct teaching. This is, this is, this is a, a teaching that anybody who's awoken to their true nature, who's realized the self, anybody who's realized that will know exactly what this teaching means. As actually, a lot of the early Christians did. In the first couple of centuries, most of the Christianity that was going around the Middle East was actually Gnostic Christianity. It was not literalist Christianity, which won out um, some shortly afterwards. But in the first century and a half to two centuries, the vastly overwhelming predominant type of Christianity that there was, was various forms of Gnostic Christianity. And Gnosticism, Gnostic really could be interpreted as to awaken. That's what it was. Gnosis means to be awake to spiritually be awake. In other words, to realize what Christ realized. To self-realization is what Gnostics were aiming at. And of course, they saw the whole Bible uh, in terms of, of allegorical to this process of awakening. But like most traditions, after three or four centuries, the literalists won out <laughs> after a very brutal and bloody battle, actually. But the amazing thing is that no matter what happens, spirit always wins out in the end. Even with all that, even though the literalists sort of took over the whole, the whole tradition in many ways, still the spirit of it continued. Right? And of course it continued and tended to show up in the mystics within the traditions. Right? And that's where it actually lived. That's where the heart and the soul and the living spirit actually lived in the mystics as it does in with any tradition it actually lives in the mystics always because the mystics are never chained to the words and so one of the most one of the most wonderful things i read in this that i want to share with you was just this very beginning it's a very first chapter of in john and he says this this very famous thing in the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And of course here the Word is referring to Jesus. Actually, it's not really referring to Jesus, it's referring to the Christ. The Word is the Christ. Now the Word is actually a translation from the word Logos, which was in the Greek, was Logos. And the Greek, the translate, what Greeks mean 
in its most common sense, logos means wisdom, mm -hmm. which to the Greeks was a feminine principle, not a masculine principle. It was a feminine principle. Nowadays, we think of it as a masculine principle. Mm -hmm. But up until about 1500 years ago, it was thought very much to be a feminine principle. And in the early Christians, logos was not simply translated as wisdom because, of course, in the, in the mystic core of things, words are used as pointers, not at, for their literal meaning. And what was meant by this word logos is very hard to translate. It's almost impossible to translate in, in a given phrase or a given word. But logos really means the consciousness of God. And a lot of the early Gnostic Christians actually would talk about logos actually meaning the, the consciousness of God. And so when we start to see in the beginning was the Word, and the Word came into the world, and Christ was the Word, the consciousness of God, the consciousness of the mystery of being. The mystery of being became conscious. It was realized. So the Word is the consciousness of the divine, the consciousness of the self. And of course, in the beginning, there must be the consciousness of the self. Otherwise, nothing else happens. Nothing else is possible. Without consciousness of the self, nothing else exists. And where did this, where does this consciousness of the divine, consciousness of the divine simply means self-realization. When we return to our true nature, the self wakes up. It's not the ego that wakes up. It's not the me that wakes up. The self wakes up. That's the experience. When the self wakes up, it means the mystery of being has become self-conscious. It has realized itself. And where does this consciousness come from? And of course, this consciousness comes from a virgin birth. Virgin birth is not simply this sort of miracle that people get hung up on a woman who, who supposedly had a virgin, you know, birth and all that. That's not significant, right? That's significant to the literalist interpretation. But to the mystic, the mystic immediately recognizes what the virgin birth means. Nobody has to tell them what it means because they have lived what it means. They've realized what it means. What's being pointed here is this truth that's coming into the world, the consciousness of God, the self in its realized form, this is not coming about through the, the union of opposites. We get our bodies through the union of opposites, right? Male and female come together. We get these wonderful bodies and these wonderful minds and everything that is perceivable, thinkable, feelable. This is the union of opposites. And this is wonderful. This is a, a gift. And yet, the spirit does not come about through the union of opposites. That's what the virgin birth is trying to get across. It's trying to say, this, there is something that's born within you that is not of the, of, of the opposites, which means it's not male, it's not female. It's not this, it's not that. It's not of the dualistic world. It's not even in the world. The world is in it. And when we've returned our consciousness to its source, what wakes up is that which is not the body, not the mind, not the personality. That's suddenly become conscious. You could call that consciousness, pure consciousness, spirit, Buddha nature or the self, it doesn't matter. But this is, in, in Zen, we call this the unborn. Same idea as the virgin birth. We just watch unborn nature. Or in Zen, they often have a riddle to try to push your consciousness in this direction with the question that says, who were you before your parents were born? And of course, the mind can never figure that out. That's why, that's why they put the question that way, so that it's not solvable by mind. But your consciousness goes back, who were you before your parents were born? Which is asking, what were you before duality? What are you? 
before body, before mind, before maleness or femaleness? What are you really? Because spirit is born or awakened from duality. It's not a product of the coming together of opposites. It's the infinite space in which opposites arrive out of. So right from the very beginning of this beautiful story, that this essential pointer, this very powerful pointer is given about the virgin birth. And of course, how many people have recognized what the virgin birth is really all about? Who knows? You could count them through history on your hands and toes, probably. I don't know. Maybe a few more. Because until we've gone back into ourself, into, through ourself, into the self, then we cannot, our identity is lodged in our born nature, what was given to us through the pairs of opposites. And what this is saying is, your true nature is before and beyond the pairs of opposites. The pairs of opposites have the quality of hypnosis. Where there is opposites, there tends to be a hypnotic trance. One identifies with the, what appears as a pair of opposites. So if the pair of opposites produce the male body in you, more than likely you go into this hypnotic trance and consciousness thinks, I am a man. All evidence seems to support that. I look in the mirror, I got a male body, I got a male voice, I think male thoughts. <laughs> I do male things, right? I watch, watch football on Sunday mornings. Everything seems to confirm the, the, this idea, this, this solidification of identity. And we call this, this is the hypnosis. Or in, in, in Christianity, they call this sin. Right? Which sin means, I hope you've heard by now, Sin means missing the mark. That's what sin means. When you go back to what they, what, what they, with the actual interpretation of sin, it means missing the mark. It means, oops, you missed it. You thought you were one thing, but you're actually not. You're something completely different. It's sin in its true sense has no more moral judgment to it. This whole judgment thing around sin is a complete literalist interpretation. It's done by people who are completely asleep at the spiritual wheel. Right? Because the meaning of sin, and it's not even a mystical meaning, it's the actual meaning of the word itself, where it came from, is to miss the mark. Wouldn't there be a lot less damage done if we realized that sin means to miss the mark? It means you miss the mark. Try again. Look again. Look inside. You missed the mark. It doesn't mean you're evil because you've missed the mark. It just means you've missed the mark. As soon as you've forgotten your true nature, you've missed the mark. It's not a big deal. It was set up that way. It was set up so you would miss the mark. Only later to find that you hit, hit it on the mark. And so, from the very beginning of this story, there is this very strong clue, as I said, that's sadly often missed. Because, of course, we can't really see the truth of things until our eyes open. If our eyes are not open to the inner meaning of things, all we're left with is the literalist interpretations that our mind come up with. But when our inner eyes open, Everything looks different. So, and this is a wonderful, this is another wonderful quote. So this is a quote of Christ, right? Not Jesus is the man. Jesus is the guy who was born, right? That's Jesus. Christ is the self in whom and through whom is expressed through the man called Jesus, right? The self is, is using the man called Jesus to express itself and live itself and have experiences and be awake to itself. Jesus is the human, Christ is the divine. Not that they're separate or actually different. 
Not in the end. Not when we've totally woken up, we realize they're not really separate or different. But for a manner of speaking, so that we understand that when he's speaking, it's actually the Christ that's speaking. It's the Christ nature, the Christ consciousness. And here's one of the first things that it says. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And so right from the beginning, this nature, this true nature that has awoken and awoken in the world of time and space and awoken from the world of time and space is saying, as a human being, I'm not here to do my will as a human being. That's not why I'm here. That's not why I exist. That's what's going to happen when you wake up. When you wake up, your life is over. It's finished. That's what gets annihilated is your life. And if you don't want to have your, your life and your will annihilated, then don't even think about waking up. Because this is another beautiful pointer. This isn't even a noble thing. It's not a holy thing. It's not even something that you intend upon. But when spirit really wakes up, when it wakes all the way up, then the life of the human being as the ego would want it to do is irrelevant. It becomes irrelevant to you, which is freedom itself. There's nothing more freeing than when you're, you become irrelevant. Does that make sense? Right? <laughs> now to an ego, that's terrible. It's, it's like the worst nightmare. I become irrelevant? I was always afraid of that. <laughs> Not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Right? That's saying that this, this life is about what has been realized. This life is about the self. This life is about the awakened consciousness. And that's what it's about, and that's what it's dedicated to. And this is actually, he is announcing his whole mission. And this is the Christ consciousness speaking. And of course, Jesus' whole life will prove that it's certainly not about Jesus. It's about Christ, right? Jesus would not have ended up on the cross if it was about his human life and his ego. He wouldn't have ended up there, right? He would have split town. As soon as he found someone who was looking for him, he would have saved his life. But he didn't because it wasn't really his life. It, his life really wasn't about him. As your life isn't about you and my life isn't about me. That's the realization. That's the enlightenment. When consciousness returns to its source, then life becomes about consciousness. Becomes about that source. And this is not really a, a decision. It's something that gets done through you, for you. It's not a spiritual decision that you make. Oh, I will be dedicated to spirit. That means it hasn't happened yet. Right? When we really awaken, when we turn back to see what we really are, which contrary to popular opinion is actually possible, it's possible for anybody. In fact, one of my other favorite quotes, this is going very to the end, the last one I mentioned, but we'll, we'll put the end at the first. I think that's a biblical thing to do. <laughs> in, this, in this little statement, the Christ nature, Jesus said it all, right? And nobody listened to it. And for 2,000 years, very few people have been listening to it. A few have. You've got to dig through history to find them. But he said it, and he said it up front. And then it's amazing when you realize, and nobody listened. Here's what he said. You are the light of the world. And what does everybody else say? You're the light of the world. You. You're the light of the world. Which is true. If you want to point at Jesus and say, you're the light of the world, that's true. But it's only true if you realize that that you and this you 
is essentially the same you. But ego's job is to project divinity onto everything outside of oneself because it's a very cunning way to keep consciousness from returning to its source. Right? As long as we see divinity out here, then consciousness awareness will be focused out here and we'll never have to return and look within. We will think we'll be looking within. We think we will imagine that we're looking within. We can spend decades under the delusion that we're looking within. We can meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate and meditate and be absolutely convinced that we're looking within when we're actually not. Because when we look within for a second, and it only takes a split second, one split second of really looking within, and the self awakens. One split second, that's all it takes. Half of a half of a half of a second. And Jesus is saying it right up front. You are the light of the world. You are the light of consciousness. You are the self. Conscious, awakened, you are it. And almost the rest of humanity said, no, 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 you're it. So it was like this sort of ball game, you know? You're it, no, you're it, no, you're it, no, you're it, no, you're it. Except for some of the, the, the mystics who go very, very deep, who go really inside, who follow that thread of consciousness back to its source. And when the consciousness returns to its source, your identity with body-mind is cut. It happens spontaneously when you return to the source. Your identity with body-mind is severed, just like that. It may take you who knows how long to get there, but at the moment, all of your energy, all of your resource, all of your consciousness has returned to its source. Something is cut, and that is the one's identification with form, with body and mind and personality. That means hitting the mark. In Zen, we have an expression that's like two arrows meeting in midair, tip to tip. It's actually the expression of the relationship between the teacher and student. That's the whole point. And of course, as I've said many times, that the whole, the traditional definition of Zen is a direct transmission outside of words and scriptures between teacher and student. Like two arrows meeting in midair. That's the, that's the metaphor that's used. That's the image that's used. Two arrows meet in midair. When those two arrows meet in midair, they extinguish each other. And what's left is what you are. Teachers extinguished, students extinguished. Only the self remains. It's a version of hitting the mark instead of missing the mark. And so when you return your awareness back to its source and the mark gets hit, then the one who's looking and whatever you're looking at is extinguished, just disappears. And all that's left is infinite, the infinite, infinite space, infinite consciousness. That's all that's left. When these two errors meet in midair, they extinguish each other. And of course, another phrase that's really come with, with Christianity, I'm sure you've also heard the word repent which unfortunately also has sort of a moralistic overtone to it through the centuries, right? That you're supposed to repent. Repent just means turn around. That's the meaning, right? So wouldn't that have been interesting if everywhere in the Bible you read the word repent, that they had actually translated it correctly, and instead of repent, they just said turn around. So there's Jesus not saying repent. He's saying turn around. Because that's what he meant. That's what repent actually means. 
until the mind puts an, an asleep mind will always put moralistic overtones and judgments on things because that's what egos do they judge right they judge and they condemn that's an ego thing in fact they can't really do anything else <laughs> So when we repent, it simply means turn around. That means you're missing the mark. Turn around. Change your direction. You're going one way. Turn your consciousness in the opposite direction. Let it come through your born nature. Through the mind, through the body. And keep going and keep going and keep going into the unknown. As the great German mystic Meister Eckhart said, into that place where distinction never gazed.